Hello, everybody, and welcome to episode 72 of Ask the CEO with Abraham Gatile. Today, I'd like to introduce a very special guest. He's a cool hunter who increases global brands' revenue and market share by using technology to develop stronger emotional connections between businesses and their customers. He's a top influencer on the Internet of Things and the fourth most followed CMO on Twitter. He's the chief marketing officer for Singapore-based intelligent IoT messaging company, Unified Inbox. He's a popular author and a frequent speaker on leveraging technology for marketing. A man so great, we had to bring him on three times. It is my pleasure to welcome the one and only Ken Heron. Welcome back, Ken. Thank you, Abraham. You can introduce me anytime, anywhere. I am 100% fine with that. <laughs> That's awesome. You know, it seems like we have this thing going on here. So for everybody just tuning in, this is Ken's third appearance here. And it seems like every, about every 20 episodes or so, uh, we bring you on. So our next, uh, our next interview is, I guess, episode uh, 93. <laughs> I'll put it on my calendar. Awesome. So Ken, before we jump into some exciting news about your company's accomplishments with artificial intelligence, can you just give our audience a quick overview on what intelligent IoT messaging is? Sure. Probably the easiest way to explain it is with a use case. You now have a thermostat that is smart, that is connected. That means it's connected to the internet. Typically, we talk to those connected devices through mobile apps, through our smart speakers. We give an alternative. We allow people to talk to that smart device. That's where the thing in Internet of Things comes from. That device or that service on whatever communications channel they choose to use. If you look at your phone right now, you may have some dumb home apps. It may control the refrigerator, it may control the dishwasher, it may control your TV. You probably also have a large number of communications apps, and that can vary based on what country you're in. Here in the US, we tend to use SMS text messaging. That tends to be our go-to because for a long time it's been free. We haven't had to pay extra for that in the US. In other countries where they still pay a very steep price for text messaging, they tend to use WhatsApp. They can use Viber. They can use Telegram, Line, all of these different chat and messaging apps. We enable people to talk literally through voice or instant messaging to operate, to control the different devices and allow the devices to send people alerts and notifications. Wow. So let's take an example. If I wanted to check if my light is on. Mm -hmm. Great example. You would, again, thanks to the artificial intelligence and the natural language recognition, you could say, hey, light, are you on? There doesn't have to be any specific command, so it can be as natural, as casual, as organic as you choose to speak. You can say, hey, light, are you on? Uh, or say, is it dark? Is it light? However you choose to use it. What uh, I have found very entertaining and quite fun is even though you initially teach the AI, you need to seed it because as we know, AI starts off being pretty dumb to start with, it learns over time. So the more users you have, it learns how you speak to it and it can understand very well when it has a large number of users. You've probably seen a lot of articles about China's big on AI, why are they successful? And part of that secret is not such a secret. They have a very large audience of people. So very quickly, they can educate the AI and help it to get smarter. Gotcha. Now, what kind of companies would be a good fit for this technology? We have three areas of focus, smart home, smart enterprise, some people call that industry 4.0, and smart city. So we sell to a lot of global manufacturers of stuff, a lot of people who make things, make connected products, because we give them an alternative that is less expensive, that allows them to create new revenue services, new subscription services, for example. It also makes for a better user experience. Let me give you a real life example. You are shopping for a new suite of kitchen appliances. You need the refrigerator, the dishwasher, the oven. 
if you have an alternative that allows you to operate and control those devices without the need for a separate app, in many cases, a separate app for each of the different devices, that's convenient. You like that. Uh, it gives you greater capability. And of course, the company, the manufacturer loves it because instead of having to go through an Amazon or a Google, they can see what the data is, what those conversational analytics are, so they can improve the product based on what you really want it to do and how you really use it. And you know, this is an interesting angle because many smart devices today have applications and an app is a very fixed interface. It's pretty much what you see is what you get. It's very expensive for manufacturers. It's fair to say that the car companies, because all the new cars now have apps with them, I didn't buy a BMW because they make a great app. You buy whatever car you happen to choose based on the car and the price. So, so many companies have been forced to go into the app business. And it's difficult because you just said it, the app itself is fixed until a new release comes out so you're having to change the natural consumer behavior to teach people. Your, first, you have to find it. You have to download it. You have to keep it updated. But you also have to figure out how to use it. I would like to think of myself as sufficiently geeky, you know, reasonably intelligent on a good day, if you don't catch me too early in the morning. But the ability to use 5, 10, 50, 100 different apps, literally a different app, with a different interface, different buttons, that could become or, or very these different products, well, it even becomes dangerous. At home, it's cumbersome. But in the workplace, if I'm operating a drill press, if I'm operating a dam, if I'm operating different city infrastructure, it actually becomes potentially dangerous because there's a higher risk for error and you don't want bad things to happen. We tend to think of IoT security in terms of people hacking in, bad actors getting access, but part of IoT security is the simplicity, the ease of use. If my product is now difficult to use or confusing to use and somebody isn't using it correctly, that's as big a worry about IoT security as bad people come in and hacking it and trying to take over my dishwasher, which I don't think anyone's going to do, but you never know. That's a great point. And another thing I love about what you said is the predictive analytics which is the data, you know, in the app, you only, mm -hmm. only collect the data the app lets you collect. <laughs> lets you collect. Exactly. I think of it as the app is great for multiple choice data. Did they do A, B, or C? Well, what if I have an open essay question that I want my dishwasher to play music? Well, my dishwasher was never designed to play music, but guess what? If 10,000 people from around the world are asking the dishwasher to play music, you know someone's going to be very smart and say, hey, this is a business opportunity. And it goes the other way. Most products, I don't want to say are over-designed, many modern products have a lot of feature functionality, not all of which is used by every market geographically. So I'll give a real world example. If my washing machine has 32 different wash cycles, but the country I'm selling the machine is only uses three to five, Maybe I can lower the price of the machine, but still give people exactly what they want. The customer wins because they have a lower price. I win because I'm better meeting the customer needs. And maybe the machine is simpler to operate because there's fewer choices. Instead of having to pick or figure out which of these 32 different wash cycles is best, I have the top five that are known to be most popular down to a country, down to a city, even down to an individual postal code. The ability to really get granular in the targeting because you now have the data to make these days, these marketing, these product management decisions, that's very exciting as well. It is. And this pretty much goes along the lines of customer experience, like you mentioned earlier, where it seems like that's really going to be a major focus of artificial intelligence is improving that customer experience. So going along those lines of customer experience, I know your company Unified Inbox just recently announced a major accomplishment called Ask William. Can you tell me about it? Sure. We're working in partnership with the National Museum of Singapore. Thank you, your museum. You have a lot of works of art 
but maybe attendance is not what you would like it to be. Maybe you want to better engage younger people who maybe don't traditionally go to the museum as much. This is a way of making the exhibits, making the art more interactive. Uh, we call it giving art a voice. That now an artifact, it can be a sculpture, it can be a painting, it can be a drawing, you can now interact with that piece of art in some really clever ways. Ask William is a prototype, so it was meant as a test bed. So you can go into, the exhibition is called Magic and Menace, and it's some of the drawings of, from the William Farquhar collection, which is about 450 drawings, natural history drawings, plants, birds, animals. You can take a photo of a drawing that catches your eye, and William will message you back with what you're seeing in the drawing, explaining when it was done, explaining the plant, how it's used. So you can take a photo, send it to William, he'll respond. And again, on the channels that you want to use uh, for the prototype, we are, include WhatsApp, Line, and Facebook Messenger, all in English to start, but you could just as easily do other languages. We also allow, and we're seeing this being used for student groups, that they can be assigned questions. What are the uses of ginger? You know, how did people use the pepper plant you know, centuries ago? That they can ask William these questions directly and get answers. So you have the ability to take photos and get responses. You have the ability to ask questions directly about what has been shown in the drawings. You can also use it as a chatbot for the museum. When does the museum close tonight? What are the ticket prices? what's the special program this weekend that you can query and get answers to all of those different questions. We also think it's fun that it can act as a self-guided tour. That now William, as the personality, as the owner of the collection, even though he's been dead for a few years now, can actually guide you through his collection going from drawing to drawing. And what's fun there is that you have this incredible ability. I, I, it's really only limited by your imagination. If I wanted to do a children's program focused on a specific age range of the things that they're interested in, I could very easily have the bot, the artificial intelligence, the, the smart museum guide geared towards children of a certain age level. If I'm the museum, and we know many have done this, if I'm having a singles night, trying to get more people into the museum and I have adults coming in with adult beverages, maybe the content is different for single adults in their 20s and 30s, even if it's the art is the same, but I can now target what I share about the art. Um, it's fair to say that art tells the story of the artist. It tells the story of that period in history of when it was created. The more I can understand the artist, the more I can understand that time in history, the better I can appreciate and experience that art. As we say, the more I experience the art, the more I'm actually learning and understanding about myself as well. So I love this, that a single painting, thanks to AI, can be experienced in very different ways by different people. So it's not just language, but it can actually be the age or the experience of the person who's going through and using the AI. And isn't it true that where the industry is headed is really with uh, personalization, where people want yeah. personalized experiences? I would add to that, it's personalization. No differently than if I were to sit down at your laptop right now, I would be a fish out of water because you have personalized it to the way you want to use your laptop and you'd have the same experience with mine. So it's personalization that customization of the experience, but it's also about personality. You can't go to Singapore and not be overwhelmed by the culture, the people, the history. When I go to a museum in Singapore, that can now be a truly authentic Singaporean experience. If I go to a museum in Abu Dhabi, that can be radically different. It can be culturally appropriate and give a better sense of self. I should also mention one of the cool things about the AI is that you can use it right here from Florida or right here from New Jersey. I don't have to be in Singapore to have that experience. So for a museum to be able to open their doors virtually 24 seven, whether I'm in Singapore, whether I'm at the museum or not, that's very exciting as well. 
because that brings more people into what they're doing, creates new sources of revenues. Again, we're a business. Yeah, there's nothing wrong with being a for-profit business. So if I can sell tickets to my exhibition to people who aren't in the country, who may never step foot in the museum, that's a pretty radical business model. Because as part of my mission statement of the museum, it's to help share and help people understand the culture of the people of Singapore. The broader I can do that, the bigger my success beyond revenue. Yeah, for sure. I mean, here, here you have a local business, which is for all practical purposes, limited in scope to that locality. Yet here they have an opportunity to expand beyond their borders around the globe. And that's a great takeaway point for AI and that AI by definition makes virtually every business global that you're now able to reach people who might not otherwise discover you, come across you, and who may never physically experience your business, but that doesn't mean you can't share the value you've created. Whether it's in a traditional e-commerce sense of physically shipping whatever your product is to them, and of course, if you're a service business, that service can be done you know, online just as we're speaking now. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, it seems like this test bed of Ask William right now, it's, uh, it's an art solution, but it could very well, it could very easily translate into retail, into uh, food and beverage, or many other uh, customer facing industries. Well, we laugh about it that the original solution, this ability to identify the image came out of factories to identify parts, that when a part is so dirty and damaged and corroded, you need to be able to figure out what the part is, you know, with your hand full of grease and gunk. So you take a photo of it, it goes to the database and says, oh, that's part one, two, three, would you like to reorder? So this is actually an industrial IoT, an IIoT solution that's being used in a museum. Wow, this is totally gonna revamp customer support. It changes the way that we can interact with objects and that the object itself, um, I think of the Ikea and a lot of us have seen the augmented reality for how to assemble Ikea furniture that I take a photo of this thing. I can't pronounce the name of it. I don't know what it's called. I, I don't need to care. And it can be the barcode, the QR code. And now on my phone, it will walk me through the steps. So even if I am a complete, uh, someone who should not be allowed to, to touch a screwdriver because I'm such a inept person with it, I can now correctly and confidently assemble the furniture because the AI walks me through. It knows that it's this kind of chair and it walks me through the correct assembly of it. We're seeing that with auto mechanics. We're seeing it with furniture assembly. All of these uh, things that I used to have to go to someone else to do, not because I needed specialized tools, but because I needed specialized knowledge. Well, if it, I've seen a lot of them that have the appearance of magic hands. I simply do what the magic hands do, and suddenly I have a built chair or I've changed the oil in my car, and I've done it safely and securely. So, Ken, how did Ask William get its name? Ask William got its name from the first, the major general, William Farquhar, who was the first resident of Singapore. So it was named after him because in his time period, he commissioned these 400 plus natural history drawings to document what he was seeing in Singapore so that it could be shared. He didn't have the ability to whip out his cell phone and take photos of the plants, So he commissioned local Chinese and Malay artists to draw and the drawings are incredible. If you've not seen them, they, they really are amazing. The, the art of the drawings, even though they're drawing the plants, the level of detail, the level of precision that you see in them really is something uh, that they are absolutely worth seeing. And this exposes them in a new light. This brings them potentially to a new audience. Uh, perfect example, last week, you and I were not talking about natural history drawings from the William Farquhar collection. Now, thanks to artificial intelligence, more people are learning about it, more people are hearing about it. So I know many of your viewers, they'll be curious, they'll go to Google, say, hey, tell me about this, or go to the museum's website, 
that's part of the museum's mission because that's such a large part of their history to help people understand the flora and the fauna of the region. Now, I imagine Ask William becoming some kind of a celebrity, sort of like Siri. Are there any hidden features such as jokes or witty comments that people can trigger? There are. Uh, I will confess I was part of the team that helped to educate William. So depending on if you ask any questions about dung, you may be surprised by some of the answers. If you ask questions about stinky foods, you may be surprised by some of the answers. Um, it needs to be appropriate for the museum, but I tend to think if you're an eight-year-old boy and uh, some of the plants are really stinky and a lot of them have some fun history as to what they were named after, how things were used, uh, I did not realize I would learn as much as I did uh, even to the point that in many parts of, of his, the history of the region, the pepper plant, literally pepper, was more valuable than gold for a long period of time. So it, it helps you to understand these things and gives a little more of a context. Before modern medicine, plants were used for that. And it's interesting to me that how many of the plants we still use for those medicinal purposes, you know, people still use ginger, you know, if they've got an upset stomach or or getting seasick, so many of these things were discovered so long ago. So it, it's entertaining, and that's part of, you can educate and entertain. I think that's more interesting. It also, if you say something, I won't say shocking or provocative, but something a little bit unexpected, you have the potential for people to share it and talk about it, which is part of the mission statement as well. Yeah, exactly. And we're gonna post a link to uh, Ask William so people can try it out for themselves. Fantastic. So, Ken, what's next for Ask William? We are working with the museum on that. Uh, part of it is expansion, simply scaling it, that we've done it for 18 drawings to start. Okay, let's look at how that can be used in other exhibitions with maybe other personalities to really get the full value out of this. I like the idea that this can become the full museum guide that I can land in Singapore and I can ask William, hey, what's on this weekend? And it can, based on my interest and what I want to see, it can make suggestions. It can be your full digital arts concierge. There's no reason to limit it to painting, sculpture. It can be for performance, for theater. So I can see it, uh, we're here in the US, many of us are familiar with the TKTS booth in Times Square, we want our half price Broadway tickets, we go into the city, that's where we get them. Many people learn of Broadway shows through that. This can be the way that people learn of what's going on in the art scene in Singapore. Wonderful. Now, what's next for Unified Inbox? So much cool stuff. I can't share it all at this point, but I can share that we recently signed an agreement with Conrad Connect, Conrad is one of the biggest companies in Germany and across Europe. So with the Conrad Connect Agreement, you can now go in. They have thousands of different products. So you can now go in and connect one of your connected products to Unification Engine, which is the technology that powers Ask William, sign up through them, and now you can operate that device. So it really gave us access to a huge, huge inventory of products beyond which we had kind of grown organically. So it's a great relationship. It'll give their users this magical ability to talk to their products, and it gave us access to all of these different products. Wonderful. And that sounds really exciting because now you're taking this, like you said, this amazing technology and you're making it plug and play. They can just select that from that uh, marketplace and add it to their uh, smart products. Exactly. And the most popular products, because I know you were thinking of asking, uh, they're very big on thermostats. So if you have a connected thermostat, you can use Conrad Connect to connect it. They also have all the different fitness bands and fitness products. They're also very big on lights and door locks. Germans like their door locks. So all of the different connected locks, they are all on the side as well which makes it very easy to control them. 
So if you want to give your mother access to be able to come in and out of your home, and maybe you don't want to give your parents access, maybe that is the last thing. Let's uh, use a different example, your children. Maybe you want them to be able to come home, so you give them access, and now through whatever they happen to use on the smartphone, again, it can be texting, it can be a messaging app or a chat app, they can now control the door locks, and of course you have full notification. So that the minute they come in, you get a message on the channel that's most convenient for you to tell them that they come in. And if it's a door lock with a camera or a video, it can actually share that with you as well. Nice. You know, I'm thinking that this could actually have applications for things like the Amazon lock. Yes, very much so. Any connected product. We have a very simple mantra. It's any device on any channel in any language. That's simple enough to remember. So talking about connected, how do people connect with you? I'm on Twitter. So at sign Ken Heron, K-E-N-H-E-R-R-O-N. I'm also on LinkedIn uh, and probably all of the other networks you can find. I admit I'm not quite that big on Pinterest. I'm a little more time on Twitter and LinkedIn. So those are probably the best ways for people to connect with us. And a plug out for the company website, please check us out. It is unifiedinbox.com. You can also test, you know, we, we put it out there so people can play with it themselves. We have a demo website. And for a number of products, we have direct integration. So if you happen to own a Nest thermostat, you can go to nest, N-E-S-T, .unifiedinbox.com, and it's free for you to control your Nest thermostat. Wow, fantastic. So I'm going, to put that, I'm going to put all that into the show notes so people can just click on that and get right to you. Ken, do you have any parting words of wisdom that you'd like to share with the audience? It always starts with what it is you're trying to achieve. People get very excited about artificial intelligence and IoT, and, and we see them as really joined at the hip. But it starts, if you're a business that's trying to figure out what to do with this, uh, People have thrown about the term business transformation. If you're trying to figure out how can my business use this, start with what it is you're trying to achieve. For some people, it's all about cost reduction, and that's great. For others, it's all about revenue generation or lead generation. That's equally valid. If you can be very clear and honest with yourself as to what you're trying to achieve, the solution will be that much stronger, and you'll get to it that much faster. Ken, thank you so much for sharing your time and your wisdom. I really enjoyed having you on the show. Thank you. I look forward to our fourth session. <laughs>